So I want to thank you for this invitation again. I am happy to be able to speak to you today on a subject that I feel is a very important and often forgotten about subject, and that is the importance of the patient history, the importance of speaking to the patient about their hair loss history. And the key point I'd like to make today is really that so much information that ultimately leads to the patient's diagnosis comes from the patient history. And we often forget in dermatology and in hair medicine just how relevant the patient history can be. I don't have any conflicts of interest about anything I'm going to speak about today. And so what we are going to focus on today is the patient history. What are some key questions that we should be asking our patients in order to gain a better understanding of their diagnosis? You know, it's often said that dermatology is a visual specialty. And for many uh, in the room, uh, it's clear that this comment is an appropriate comment when one is applying for dermatology or one is um, telling others why dermatology appeals to them. Dermatology is a visual specialty. The thing I'd like to remind you is that it's not often said, but dermatology is also an auditory specialty. That the information that comes in from our ears can be just as important sometimes as the information that comes in uh, from our eyes. And that is particularly true in hair loss medicine. And I'd like to share some of this with you today. The great William Osler once said that we should listen to our patients because they are telling us the diagnosis. And I really think this quote is uh, very relevant to today's lecture because it's the information that our patients give to us that really can pinpoint us towards the correct diagnosis. So why do we need a logical approach? Well, many hair loss conditions can look similar. This is particularly true in female hair loss. These six women in this photograph here have slightly different types of hair loss. And so if you have as a rule the fact that central hair loss in women is synonymous with female pattern hair loss, you're going to make a lot of correct diagnoses, but you're going to make a lot of incorrect diagnoses. Some of these women in this photograph have alopecia areata, some have telogen effluvium, some have genetic hair loss, some have scarring alopecia. Um, the physical examination will certainly be important to diagnosing the correct condition, but the diagnosis can also be ascertained from history. And in challenging situations where there's a challenging biopsy or there's a challenging uh, physical examination or uh, non-specific findings by trichoscopy, the patient's history leads you in the right direction. So what are the steps that we need then to diagnose hair loss? Well, we take a history, we examine the patient, and we consider what blood tests are relevant. And what I'd like to remind you today is that the history should not be ignored. So what are the top things that we really need to know on history? Well, this particular slide shows the top 10 things that I think are relevant uh, in a patient who presents with hair loss. And we're going to go through each of these one by one uh, to give you some examples of the relevance of each of these points and why the information we gain from each of these uh, questions really points us in the direction of the diagnosis. So let's start with age. Why is age important? Well, age is important because Epidemiologically, there are certain hair loss conditions that occur by age group. Uh, we'll begin first with children. There are three conditions which are particularly relevant in children, and um, a pediatric hair loss clinic sees a lot of patients with alopecia areata, trichotillomania, and tinea capitis. Of course, you need to have a broad understanding of hair shaft disorders, telogen effluvium, um, but one needs to be able to differentiate between trichotillomania and alopecia areata, which can be challenging. Uh, and we'll take a look at some of these examples. Alopecia areata 
is strongly influenced by genetics. 70% of the disease is contributed by the genetic profile of the patient. Clearly there are environmental factors, but because genetics is so important, this means that this condition presents at early ages. And in fact, about half of patients with alopecia areata present before the age of 20. And so alopecia areata is very much a condition seen in the pediatric uh, hair loss clinic. Here's a typical example of a child with alopecia areata affecting the eyebrow and the eyelashes. And again, one needs to keep a broad differential in any child presenting with hair loss. Um, this particular child has loss of both the upper and lower eyelashes, uh, has loss of the eyebrows, uh, and there may be specific findings from uh, trichoscopy which point us in the right direction. The loss of both the upper and lower eyelid eyelashes would point us more towards the direction of alopecia areata than trichotillomania, where there is a more prominent favoring of the upper eyelashes being lost. But nevertheless, uh, this is alopecia areata in children. This is a young four-year-old boy with uh, advanced alopecia areata. Um, alopecia areata presenting in children and presenting with more advanced hair loss is a poor prognostic factor, as you are aware of. This individual has alopecia areata and not alopecia totalis. And the reason I mention this to you is just to remind you that when a parent is sitting in front of you who is very well read about alopecia areata, prognostic factors, treatments, and they say to you, do you think my child has alopecia totalis? What they're thinking is, uh, what is the precise prognosis of this child? Um, it's important to keep in mind that this child in this photograph has alopecia areata, an advanced form. Provided there's some hair remaining on the scalp, the term alopecia areata is more appropriate. So again, we're focusing here on age and the importance of ascertaining the age of the patient. And in the pediatric age group, we often separate age in these categories that I've shown in, in this slide from zero to three, four to 10, and then 11 to 18. This slide um, is a slide I created because it helps me remember a couple of important points. And that is that in children in, in puberty, the group of hair loss conditions that we see is very similar to what we see in adults. The differential diagnosis of hair loss in a teenager or an adolescent is very similar to an adult. And so we have conditions such as alopecia areata, early onset genetic hair loss, telogen effluvium, uh, trichotillomania, and traction. In the newborn to age three, we have a different set of conditions. We have the hair shaft defects, uh, we have alopecia areata, tinea capitis, we have hair pulling uh, as, a, as a habit, and we have birth trauma, and we have some of the genetic hair loss conditions also presenting. I'd like to remind you, as we talk about age and the relevance of age, is that all children, especially young children, need um, their hairs examined under the microscope as part of a complete examination. And I don't mean uh, hematoxylin and eosin staining, I mean clipping a hair with scissors and putting it between two slides and looking under the microscope for hair shaft disorders. Hair shaft disorders um, can be missed quite easily. Um, and with the use of a simple slide mount, um, they can be easily picked up. And so a complete examination of a young child who presents with hair loss includes the examination of a hair shaft under the microscope. In the age group four to 10, we have similar groups of conditions. We have alopecia areata, we have loose antigen syndrome, trichotillomania, traction, tinea capitis, telogen effluvium. Loose antigen syndrome often presents in this age group and that particular diagnosis has many different clinical presentations. It can be a hair shedding type disorder, it can be a um, presentation where the hair doesn't grow long, but again, that particular diagnosis can be captured by examining hairs under the microscope. And so, uh, if I'm seeing a, a young child, uh, especially a pre-pubertal child, 
uh, I will clip a few hairs and simply examine them under the microscope as part of a complete examination. The age of the patient in front of you is very relevant. Who comes in to the adult dermatology clinic? Well, the typical clinic would include patients who present with genetic hair loss, um, telogen effluvium, alopecia areata. A subspecialty clinic, uh, like our clinic, might of course include a high proportion of patients who present with scarring alopecias. Um, but these are the presentations that uh, are typically occurring in adults. And as we think carefully about the relevance of age, I'd like to walk you through a few scenarios. Because I think these scenarios are really helpful because they help us uh, uh, remember just why the age is so important. Consider this first scenario. This is a 23-year-old female who is referred for evaluation of chronic telogen effluvium. Now, the reason this particular uh, scenario is so important um, when I receive a scenario like this is I immediately say to myself, it would be unusual for a 23-year-old female to be presenting with typical chronic idiopathic telogen effluvium. Chronic telogen effluvium, when the condition is used properly, the name is used properly, is a hair shedding disorder which occurs in women in their mid-30s to their mid-60s, where these patients present with hair shedding in the absence of any identifiable factor. When I use the term chronic telogen effluvium, I'm referring to a very specific and unique condition, which is often misdiagnosed and often uh, given the uh, inappropriate um, term. But chronic telogen effluvium is a very specific condition. Uh, women with chronic telogen effluvium once had very thick hair. They have hair loss. They have hair shedding. Um, but a 23-year-old female who presents with shedding could have chronic telogen effluvium. But what is much, much more likely is that this individual has acute telogen effluvium from low iron, a thyroid disorder, uh, weight loss, a medication. Uh, such as an oral contraceptive, isotretinoin, or some other medication. Or the reason they are shedding is because they have early onset androgenetic alopecia. So when I receive a referral from uh, a patient who is uh, in their early 20s who has chronic shedding, I'm skeptical of chronic telogen effluvium. Again, age is important. What about this scenario? Please see this 28-year-old female for evaluation of frontal fibrosing alopecia. Well, I introduced this slide into the talk because of a couple of reasons. First, we do see 28-year-old women with frontal fibrosing alopecia. It's certainly not common. Most women who present with frontal fibrosing alopecia are in their uh, late 40s, early 50s, late 50s. A 28-year-old female who's referred for frontal fibrosing alopecia could have frontal fibrosing alopecia, but they may have traction alopecia. They may have early onset androgenetic alopecia. They may have changes in their hairline, which are just consistent with age-related maturation of the hairline. And so I really remain open to a very broad differential in a 28-year-old female presenting with um, a diagnosis of possible frontal fibrosing alopecia. Of course, they could have frontal fibrosing alopecia. Proper examination is needed. The thing I wanted to remind you about, um, which you may or may not be aware of, is that women presenting with frontal fibrosing alopecia may have a slightly increased incidence of early menopause. And so when I see a 28-year-old woman referred for frontal fibrosing alopecia, in addition to wondering whether the diagnosis is correct, the second thing I'm wondering about is if this woman wishes to have a family, has she yet completed her family? And if she has not, is there any possibility that she has early menopause? And if she does, how do we diagnose it? And what steps do we need to take now? So as an aside, I'd like to remind you that menopause on average occurs at about age 51 in North America, and about one in 100 women have early menopause, defined as menopause or uh, menopausal symptom occurring before the age of 40. 
a limited number of studies, including some uh, studies by uh, Sergio Vano Galvan from Spain, um, led us to believe that the incidence of early menopause in women with frontal fibrosing alopecia may be much higher. It may be as high as one in eight. And certainly we have seen this phenomenon in the clinic and something that um, I'm very interested in, and that is when we see patients under 40 with, early, with frontal fibrosing alopecia, we need to be thinking about early menopause. Even if the um, female individual has completed her family, the diagnosis of early menopause is extremely important in order to help that patient reduce her risk for uh, cardiovascular disease, um, optimize bone health, optimize psychological health, uh, as well as a, a, a variety of other factors as well. And so thinking about early menopause is very important and tests such as uh, FSH or follicle stimulating hormone, hormone uh, ultrasounds, other hormonal tests, um, an AMH, uh, referral to gynecology uh, may be important in a young woman presenting with FFA. Age is very important in your hair loss history. What about this 19-year-old female who's referred for evaluation of advanced androgenetic alopecia? When I have a referral for a young patient who's referred for androgenetic alopecia, the things that I'm thinking about are, is there any possibility that this female has polycystic ovarian syndrome? Is there any possibility they have late onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia from 21 hydroxylase deficiency? Could they have another hair loss diagnosis like telogen effluvium? And maybe the patient has a mild case of androgenetic alopecia and marked telogen effluvium and together it's making the hair loss look worse. Finally, what about a 73-year-old female who's referred for androgenetic alopecia that's really gotten a lot worse over the last 12 months? Well, when you understand the natural history of androgenetic alopecia, you realize that androgenetic alopecia does not get worse over a year span in a 73-year-old woman. And so if I'm re I receive a referral of this uh, manner, the questions that I have is, uh, do we have another diagnosis? Does the patient have androgenetic alopecia, but now has another diagnosis on top of this? Do they have a telogen effluvium? Do they have a telogen effluvium from a medication? Do they have a telogen effluvium from a surgery? Do they have a telogen effluvium from uh, a stressor that's occurred in the last one year? Do they have a scarring alopecia? Do they have some other diagnosis which accounts for their reduction in hair density? And although rare, the thing you always have to uh, wonder about is could there be un any underlying um, malignancy or perineoplastic type symptom that's contributing to this patient's uh, rapid onset hair loss. Genetic hair loss moves at different rates over the span of a patient's lifetime. There are some periods where it moves fast, there are some periods where it moves slow, but the natural history is a slow and steady decline in density in certain areas of the scalp. There are three phases of genetic hair loss that I'd like to remind you of. And we're gonna come back to this slide throughout the lecture today. Um, it's a slide that I use as I think about hair loss and it's a, a graph, a diagram, that I often draw in front of my patients. There are three phases of hair loss. The first phase is a phase where nobody notices. The patient doesn't know they're losing hair, the family doesn't know they're losing hair, close friends don't know they're losing hair, but if you performed careful trichological measurements, you'd see that there's a reduction in density. That's what I call phase one. In phase two, only the patient notices that they're losing hair. This is a particularly frustrating period of time because the patient says they're losing hair, they feel that under bright lights, the scalp is more visible. When they come out of the shower, the scalp is more visible. But everyone around them, including people that know them very well, say, you're fine. I don't see any changes. Um, there's no particular concerns. The third phase of hair loss 
is the phase where the patient knows they have hair loss, the clinician knows immediately, friends know immediately, everyone around them knows immediately when they look at their hair um, that there's hair loss. Of course, the patient may camouflage it or disguise it in a way so it's still difficult, but this is the stage where um, an outsider looking at the scalp would know that there's hair loss. We're going to come back to this diagram and I introduce it to you now. So age is very relevant. In the pediatric population, the age allows us to think about certain conditions. In the adult age groups, um, the age allows us to reflect on the epidemiological, uh, the natural epidemiology of the disease. And if we're seeing something that falls outside of the normal epidemiology, as far as age presentation, we have to ask ourselves, do we have the right diagnosis? What about gender? Well, the vast majority of hair loss that occurs in men is androgenetic alopecia or male balding. And so in a typical clinic that sees patients with hair loss, in men, by far the most common diagnosis will be androgenetic alopecia. Um, and in a general clinic, uh, one would imagine that uh, greater than 95% of patients presenting with hair loss, males that is, would have genetic hair loss. Of course, in a subspecialty clinic, this might be skewed a bit. Men develop um, alopecia areata, men develop scarring alopecias, of course, but the sheer number of males affected by male balding uh, outnumbers these other conditions when you look at it as a proportion. And so by age 30, 30% of males have male balding. By age 50, 50% of males have balding. And by the advanced senior years, about 85% of males have male balding. In women, the array of hair loss conditions is much wider. Females present with androgenetic alopecia, of course. It's less common in women than in men. Conditions like telogen effluvium, uh, scarring alopecias, autoimmune issues are far more common of a reason for hair loss in women than in men. Let's take a look at a couple of these scenarios. And this will allow us to reflect on the importance of gender. Please see this 19-year-old male for evaluation of telogen effluvium. His blood tests are normal. So what kind of things do you think about in a 19-year-old male who has shedding? The point I'd like to make today is that a 19-year-old male who presents with shedding the first diagnosis, which must be on your list, and I would encourage you to put it at the top of your list, is androgenetic alopecia. Of course, this could be telogen effluvium, but androgenetic alopecia is by far uh, the most likely cause of a male presenting with shedding, um, especially in the presence of normal blood tests. Early androgenetic alopecia can be particularly challenging to diagnose both in women and in men because it presents with shedding. And this shedding mimics very nicely a telogen effluvium. Males see more hair um, on the, on the uh, computer, on their desk. Uh, some may see more uh, in the shower, um, but because of the shorter hair in general than women, um, the actual sheer number of hairs that are collected on a daily basis uh, would appear less than a woman who reports shedding. So the third thing we want to know is when did the hair loss start and how fast is it progressing? The point I want to remind you of is that rapid hair loss, extremely rapid hair loss, occurs in alopecia areata. And in fact, there are a few other conditions, with the exception of chemotherapy, that can cause as rapid of hair loss as alopecia areata. Even a massive telogen effluvium causes less hair loss than the most severe cases of alopecia areata. So a patient presenting rapid hair loss, alopecia areata is in your differential. So this is a female individual who, within the span of a month, has gone from a full head of hair to hair loss as shown in this picture. And certainly the hair loss in this photograph is occurring in the middle of the scalp, 
And you may remember that hair loss in the middle of the scalp is a common location for androgenetic alopecia in women. But the rapid onset of hair loss in this patient um, would prompt one to consider a diagnosis of alopecia areata. Of course, when you look up close, you do see exclamation mark hairs by trichoscopy. You see broken hairs. You see yellow dots. The pull test is positive. Um, one needs blood work to rule out a coexistent telogen effluvium. One needs to consider coexistent androgenetic alopecia. But a rapid and massive hair loss occurring in a month, uh, alopecia areata is at the top of the list. So when I think of the speeds of hair loss, uh, this is a chart that I often use. It reminds us that the most rapid of hair loss are those of alopecia areata and um, chemotherapy-induced hair loss. Conditions that occur moderately fast, meaning there's been a change over three months, four months, five months, uh, include alopecia areata, telogen effluviums, some of the genetic hair loss conditions. Um, Androgenetic alopecia is usually slow. In the vast majority of patients, there's not a, an uh, a discernible difference over a period of six months. But there are some individuals that have a rapidly progressing form where there can be slight changes that can be identified, but that's not common. Some scarring alopecias can occur uh, more rapidly and lead to more rapid hair loss, but that's not the norm in most scarring alopecias. Most scarring alopecias lead to a, um, a discernible difference over six to nine months or one to 18 months, one year to 18 months. Uh, that's the more typical um, rate of hair loss in most scarring alopecias, but of course there are some that are rapidly progressive and uh, a difference can be seen over a period of just a matter of months. The rate of hair loss in those scarring alopecias is never the same speed as the, as the most rapid forms of alopecia areata. Trichotillomania, of course, can occur moderately fast. Uh, an individual who um, is affected by trichotillomania can pull out a significant amount of hair very rapidly, depending on the degree of um, uh, psychological stress that that patient's experiencing. Androgenetic alopecia tends to be a slow condition. Uh, and the scarring alopecias often tend to be on the slower side. Here's an individual who presented to me with hair loss in the temples, and he advised me that one month ago he had full hair in the temples. When I look at this patient from across the room, it looks like androgenetic alopecia. It looks like he has temple recession, which is uh, very much uh, a presenting feature of males with male balding. Uh, but when I examine his scalp, and based on the history, I am quite um, uh, expecting uh, to see features of alopecia areata, and we indeed do. And steroid injections, which is a treatment for alopecia areata, into the scalp prompts hair growth within a month. And so again, confirming that this is alopecia areata. Again, rapid hair loss being alopecia areata. This particular slide shows two individuals with hair loss in the occiput. The individual on the left is a female with uh, alopecia areata. Um, dermoscopy would show exclamation mark hairs. She's losing hair rapidly. This is a very typical feature uh, of alopecia areata. The patient on the right also has hair loss in the occiput. Um, but there's a number of other features on history which really point us to the direction that uh, this may not be uh, alopecia areata. Um, this is a, an eight-year-old uh, female who has recently moved to Canada, um, doesn't speak English, has a, an extreme amount of stress in her life, uh, and is not particularly happy. And when you examine the scalp of this child, you see broken hairs, hairs of different length, black dots, uh, this is trichotillomania. Trichotillomania can affect any area that has hair. This particular presentation with hair um, down the back of the scalp that's unaffected, and hair along the back which is unaffected, is the so-called tonsure pattern, one variant of the tonsure pattern of trichotillomania. And some patients with very, very advanced trichotillomania remove all of their scalp hair but this rim of hair at the back, which hangs down over the neck, is unaffected. 
Uh, and so this particular slide is very much in keeping with a diagnosis of trichotillomania. Again, a relatively rapid moving form of hair loss, um, but not so rapid to prompt one to consider alopecia areata. What about genetic hair loss? Well, I introduced you with a slide earlier of how hair density changes over time in genetic hair loss. The thing I'd like to mention at this juncture is that the rate of genetic hair loss varies tremendously in both men and women. In some, it's a very slowly progressive condition with periods of relative stability. Um, in others, it is much more rapid in its progression. And so we are incorrect if we say to a male with genetic hair loss presenting at 36, 37, that because it didn't occur at age 18, that it's likely to be a non-rapid form. Oh. The chances of it being a rapid form are a lot less in a male, but it's by no means a guarantee. The rate of progression of androgenetic alopecia is considerably uh, different uh, patient to patient. There are some that are slow, some that are moderate, and some that uh, are more rapid in balding. Certainly a male that presents with genetic hair loss in the early um, 20s or the late teens is much more likely to have a pattern like the lower blue line, so-called patient three here, where there's more rapid progression of hair loss without treatment. An individual that presents with genetic hair loss at age 40 is much more likely to present uh, with a natural history that mimics the upper green bar, or so-called patient two here. So there are some generalizations, um, but they are no means guarantees. Again, as we talk about the rate of hair loss and we ask our patient, how fast is this occurring? We wanna ask our patient, do you look different than six months ago? Do you look different than a year ago? Because this gives us some idea about how fast it's occurring. And depending on the diagnosis, gives us some idea about what may occur in the future. This particular slide is a slide which shows the rate of progression of genetic hair loss as compared to chronic telogen effluvium. And this particular patient with androgenetic alopecia that I've mapped here has a slow and steady decline in density over time. This is very different from chronic telogen effluvium. What happens in chronic telogen effluvium is there is a sudden onset of shedding and a sudden and precipitous decline in the density of the patient's hair. The patient feels there's less hair. And then what generally happens in classic chronic idiopathic telogen effluvium, or what we should properly term CTE, is that the patient maintains the same density over time despite shedding. And so chronic telogen effluvium is a hair shedding disorder, but not a hair loss disorder, because there is not a decline in density over time. And so if a patient says to me, I have chronic telogen effluvium, and my hair is thinner this year than last, and my hair is thinner last year from the year before, and it's getting thinner and thinner over time, the thing that I wonder is, does the patient truly have chronic telogen effluvium and another diagnosis that's causing progressive hair loss, or is the wrong diagnosis um, given? Because chronic telogen effluvium does not lead to progressive worsening of hair density over time. The patient still sheds hair, but the density doesn't decline. So here's another way of looking at it. Here's a patient with chronic telogen effluvium who develops chronic shedding in 2012. So in 2011, they would say, my hair was thick and I wasn't shedding. In 2012, they say, my hair was thinning and I was shedding a lot. This is when the chronic telogen effluvium started. In 2013, the patient will say, photos captured that my density was unchanged from the year before. 
And I was very surprised that my hair looked the same as 2012 because I was shedding so much. And in 2014, the patient would say, my hair looks the same as 2013 and I'm surprised because I'm shedding so much every day that it just wouldn't make sense that my hair would be the same, but a photograph captures it. That's what chronic telogen effluvium is. So the, th the fourth thing we want to know is where the patient is losing hair. Of course, we can determine this by examining the patient ourselves, but we can ask the patient, where does your hair feel less? This diagram shows a bird's eye view of the top of the scalp and just helps to remind us that certain areas of the scalp are more likely to be affected in certain types of hair loss. The front of the scalp um, is often affected by traction alopecia. The front of the scalp can have hairline changes in the temples that's consistent with either hairline maturation or consistent with uh, other diagnoses such as uh, temporal triangular alopecia or TTA. We're going to take a look at these examples. Hair loss in the middle of the scalp is a feature of androgenetic alopecia. And we're going to take a look at this again. Hair loss all over the scalp in a diffuse manner is often consistent with telogen effluvium. There are some individuals, particularly females, present with diffuse hair loss that is consistent with androgenetic alopecia. So there is a diffuse form of androgenetic alopecia occurring in women. This is the Hamilton Norwood scale. This is a scale which is used to describe the uh, stereotypical patterns of progression of hair loss in males. So from stage one on to stage seven, we have this progressive decline in hair density through the front and the crown to stage seven where we just have this band of hair through the back of the scalp. But not all males follow the Hamilton Norwood scale. This particular male has hair loss in the center of the scalp. The frontal hairline is relatively preserved and this is a uh, so-called female pattern of male pattern balding. And so some males present with this particular pattern. Androgenetic alopecia in women um, causes hair loss in the center of the scalp. Of course, it can be diffuse. But these are very typical photos in the middle and on the right of what female androgenetic alopecia looks like. The photograph in the middle shows central hair loss where the very frontal hairline is relatively unaffected and the hair loss extends into the crown, so extends back. That's the so-called Ludwig pattern. The photograph on the right shows the uh, so-called Olsen pattern or Christmas tree pattern uh, named um, in honor of Elise Olsen who is at Duke University. The key feature is that both of these patterns, whether it's the Ludwig pattern or the Olsen pattern, um, have miniaturization when you look up close with dermoscopy. And so a female patient with androgenetic alopecia might say that the scalp is becoming more see-through. Um, the patient might say that their hair part needs to be placed further and further to the side in order to uh, bring the hair over to cover the central area of thinning. What about the temples? Again, we're asking the patient where the hair loss is occurring. Central hair loss allowing us to reflect a little bit on androgenetic alopecia, but what about the temples? Temples are challenging. And a point that I'd like to, to leave you with today are the temples can fool you. And reading a lot into temple hair loss um, can really confuse the picture unless you're careful. Performing biopsies on the temples can often trick you and often lead to erroneous diagnoses and misdiagnoses. I'd like to give you a couple of comments and points about hair loss in the temple. 
Androgenetic alopecia can give some changes in females in the temples. It's usually minor, and it's usually much less than is seen in chronic telogen effluvium and in other hair shedding issues. A patient presenting with marked hair loss in the temples and sudden marked hair loss in the temples that occurs over a short period of time, one certainly has to consider a hair shedding disorder and one has to consider the possibility of an androgen secreting tumor. Um, and in a female patient, 40, 50, 60, who presents with rapid onset temporal hair loss, um, we have to consider an androgen secreting tumor at the top of the list. Of course, there may be a hair shedding disorder. The patient may have chronic telogen effluvium. The patient's previous hairline needs to be uh, compared to determine if, if the patient had temporal recession to begin with, of course. Temple recession can be seen in traction alopecia. The woman on the left has very typical traction alopecia. The thing we want to remember about hair loss in the temples when it's traction alopecia is we're incorrect to say to our patients that traction alopecia is a non-scarring alopecia. As long as you stop the hair styling practices, your hair will regrow. That certainly can occur, but if the hair styling practices have gone on uh, quite a long time, then the hair doesn't tend to regrow as readily, and it may be more permanent. Traction alopecia affecting the front of the scalp uh, may be associated with a so-called fringe sign, where the patient retains a band of hair along the very, very front, as shown here by the arrows, and the hair behind it is removed. In various hair styling practices that are used by the patient, it may be that the very frontal hairs are difficult to remove from the scalp. And as we think about the temples, I'd like to remind you of a couple other things that you want to keep in your differential diagnosis. One is temporal triangular alopecia, a favorite for um, board examinations or for our residents. The thing you want to remember about um, the diagnosis of temple hair loss is you have a number of other entities as well which we'll look at, um, including uh, scarring alopecias like frontal fibrosing alopecia, but also hairline maturation, normal changes in the hairline in human beings. So this male is an individual with temporal triangular alopecia or triangular alopecia who was referred to me for refractory alopecia areata. The patient was not getting hair growth despite steroid injections and um, the question was what treatments could be considered to grow hair. When I looked at the scalp of this patient, I considered the possibility of uh, temporal triangular alopecia and there was one question that I asked this patient that hadn't been asked before which really led to the diagnosis. I said to the patient, do you remember having hair loss in this area in grade school? And the patient's answer was, of course, that I remember every year when the class photo came up in the fall, that I would part my hair in a certain way to cover that area so that it wouldn't be showing in the class photo. The second question is, it, is it relatively unchanged from grade school? It's relatively unchanged from grade school. That is temporal triangular alopecia, and there's no other diagnosis that it could be. Temporal triangular alopecia is in the differential of hair loss that occurs in the temples. This is a um, triangular shaped area of hair loss with the point or the apex pointing up to the crown. It occurs to the side or lateral to the eyebrow. And so if you draw a line up past the eyebrow into the scalp, it occurs laterally to that line. Temporal triangular alopecia. What about hairline maturation? Hairline maturation is a concept that is very familiar to hair restoration surgeons, but it may be less familiar to you. And I'd like to introduce this concept to you because it's very important. The hairline that we get as adults 
is different than the hairline that we get as children. And so there is this genetic programming that says what our hairline is supposed to do as adults. And just like we grow an inch between age 8 and 10, we have our hairline change between age 17 and 28. And it's often confused for androgenetic alopecia, and it's often a source of tremendous anxiety for some males and some women as well. Hairline maturation refers to the moving back of the hairline about one finger breadth or so, and some moving back of the temples. When the hairline moves back further than that, then one needs to consider some coexistent androgenetic alopecia. But a male who says, my temples are moving back, has either hairline maturation or androgenetic alopecia or both. But many of these patients have hairline maturation. And so it needs to be photographed and documented and followed, but this is in many cases just a change in the patient's hairline. Hairline maturation in males has been carefully studied in the hair restoration world. Hairline maturation in females and the shape of the female hairline um, from adolescence to early adulthood has not been nearly as carefully studied. There is a tremendous variation in the shape of hairlines, the placement of the widow peak, the placement of different mounds or shapes of hair in the female hairline, um, then in the male hairline, and it presents with an array of confusing pictures in terms of what's happening to the temples. And so when you're diagnosing hair loss in the temples, I would urge you to step back a minute and ask yourself, am I confident in the diagnosis? And if I am, can I get any other clues from another area outside of the temples that I might be right? What about scarring alopecia? Again, we're asking our patient about the location of their hair loss. We've looked at some non-scarring alopecias and where they occur. What about some scarring alopecias? Well, the location of hair loss is just as relevant, if not more relevant, in scarring alopecia than in the non-scarring forms. Frontal fibrosing alopecia affects the front of the scalp. Lichen plano pilaris, pseudopallad, uh, central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia affects the center of the scalp. Folliculitis decalvans affects the center of the scalp, but particularly the crown, especially in men. Acne keloidalis affects the back. Um, dissecting cellulitis can affect the back, can affect the front. But the geography or the location is particularly important. Let's look a little bit at the center of the scalp. Of course, central hair loss, in our minds, is synonymous with androgenetic alopecia. But in scarring alopecia, there's a wide differential. And the thing that I'd like you to remember is that any black woman, any woman with Afro-textured hair who presents with central hair loss, you must consider CCCA or central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia as your top diagnosis you will be proven right far, far more times than you will be proven wrong. Of course, androgenetic alopecia presents in the center of the scalp in a woman with Afro-textured hair. Um, but I would encourage you to consider biopsy in these patients um, because in a large percentage of the time you will capture um, CCCA. There is probably an overlap between how CCCA presents and androgenetic alopecia, and many patients with CCCA, in fact, have androgenetic alopecia. So there's more of an overlap than we appreciate, and certainly these are some interesting studies that are uh, you know, being done by various places, including the Cleveland Clinic. Um, but the location is so important. Pseudopallad uh, presents in the central scalp, and here I'm talking about uh, classic pseudopallad of Brock. Pseudopallad presents in the central scalp. Lichen planopilaris presents in the central scalp. 
Lichen plato pilaris can, of course, affect any area of the scalp, but it often overlaps with the same areas that androgenetic alopecia presents. And of course, many of these patients have androgenetic alopecia as well, but LPP presents in the central area. This is a very typical photograph of a patient with folliculitis de Calvans, again affecting the crown. Any male patient who presents with burning and tenderness in the crown has folliculitis de Calvans until proven otherwise. You will be proven right far, far more times than you'll be proven wrong. Of course, there are other causes of burning and pain and tenderness in the crown, but a male who has burning and tenderness in the crown who wakes up with blood on his pillow, this male has folliculitis de Calvans uh, until proven otherwise. All the males in this photograph have folliculitis de Calvans. Their presentations are slightly different. The size of the um, papules, the size of the red bumps, the amount of hair loss differ. But these are all males that say, I've got burning and tenderness in my crown, it hurts. I get all these bumps, I get these pimples. That's folliculitis de Calvans, a scarring alopecia, uh, so-called neutrophilic scarring alopecia. Frontal fibrosing alopecia affects the front and the sides. So again, we're asking the patient, where do you have hair loss? We're talking about geography here. The term frontal fibrosing alopecia is not a great term. It's with us um, since 1994, but it pigeonholes us into thinking that this is a frontal scarring alopecia. Frontal fibrosing alopecia affects the front, it affects the sides, it affects the back, it affects the eyebrows, it affects the eyelashes. It affects the small vellus hairs on the face. It affects the oil glands of the face. It affects the um, uh, body hair. And so it's a much more complex diagnosis than uh, would be uh, coming simply from the title frontal fibrosing alopecia. Frontal fibrosing alopecia affects the frontal hairline. And frontal fibrosing alopecia differs from androgenetic alopecia. Androgenetic alopecia can cause hair loss in the center of the scalp, but the very frontal hairline is often kept in androgenetic alopecia. In frontal fibrosing alopecia, the frontal hairline is lost. And one can often see a difference between the very smooth, scarred skin and the sun-damaged, normal skin of the forehead. So one needs to look for that band. Of course, by dermoscopy, one sees uh, redness around the hairs, scale around the hairs sometimes, so-called lonely hairs. But uh, a female patient that says, my hairline's moving back, 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 just like my dad did. That patient is not saying, my hairline moved back, 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 just like my dad who has androgenetic alopecia did. That patient is saying, my hair is moving back, back, back because I have frontal fibrosing alopecia. And by the way, my dad's hair also moved back, back, back because he had androgenetic alopecia. What about hair loss in the nape? Well, the nape, or the back of the scalp, also has a differential diagnosis. We have alopecia areata affecting the nape, as in the upper left here. We have frontal fibrosing alopecia, um, which affects the back, and it starts in the back corners. And so if I'm not sure about frontal fibrosing alopecia, and I'm sitting across from the patient, I say, what about the back of your scalp? Do you get itching there? And the patient says, yeah, I get itching in the corners. Of course, this isn't pathognomonic of the diagnosis of frontal fibrosing alopecia, but that's where frontal fibrosing alopecia affects in the back of the scalp. Traction alopecia is shown in the bottom uh, left, and then acne keloidalis, where these patients present with these papules, these bumps, these so-called razor bumps, is another scarring alopecia affecting the back. So let's look at a scenario. Again, we're talking about geography. A 36-year-old male with itching and burning on his crown. He wakes up with blood on his pillow, and he's referred to you. Again, we've talked a little bit about this. This is folliculitis de Calvans. This is what folliculitis de Calvans does. This is an up-close dermatoscopic picture of folliculitis de Calvans. What you can see is this redness in the scalp. You have these hairs merging together. This is so-called compound hairs. And you see this redness around the hair. You can see that um, if that were to burst, you'd get bleeding. That's what folliculitis calvans can do. There's crust, there's scales. In other areas of the scalp, there's pustules. 
This itches, this burns, this is tender. This is folliculitis decalvans, a scarring alopecia in the so-called neutrophilic scarring alopecia class. What about a 36-year-old male who's referred for loss of both sideburns? The pearl I'd like to give you before we leave this concept of geography of hair loss is that males and females presenting, presenting with isolated sideburn loss these patients have frontal fibrosing alopecia until proven otherwise. It's an easy pearl to keep in the back of your mind. Um, many of these patients are referred to me for alopecia areata that's refractory. They've had steroid injections, they've had other treatments, it's just not growing. Um, they don't have any eyebrow loss, they don't have any forehead loss yet. They have frontal fibrosing alopecia. And of course many of these patients will go on to develop uh, eyebrow or forehead uh, frontal hair loss. So when hair loss is one-sided in the sideburns, it could be alopecia areata, it could be other things as well, but when you have bilateral um, sideburn loss, please think frontal fibrosing alopecia. We want to know where, um, what are the patient's symptoms? Do they have itching, burning, and pain? The point I'd like to to give you in, as we talk about symptoms is please biopsy your patients with symptoms like burning and pain and tenderness. Itching itself has a very wide differential and if we biopsied everybody with itching we'd be biopsying most patients. But patients that have itching plus burning and pain and tenderness and my scalp is sore, it feels bruised, these patients often have underlying um, diagnoses, especially scarring alopecias. So what conditions cause a so-called symptomatic scalp? Well, the differential is quite large. Seborrheic dermatitis can cause symptoms. And there are some patients with seborrheic dermatitis that have marked symptoms. You'd think they have a scarring alopecia. The scalp is tender, the scalp is red, the scalp is burning, um, and it would fool you for uh, scarring alopecia. In some of those challenging cases, of course, it's appropriate to, to biopsy the patient. Psoriasis can cause a symptomatic scalp. Telogen effluvium can cause pins and needles, sometimes a bit of itching when shedding occurs. The scarring alopecias are the, are the prototypical burning, painful, tender condition. Autoimmune diseases, alopecia areata can cause these symptoms. Stress can cause itching. Um, allergic contact dermatitis can cause scalp itching. Usually there's some redness in the scalp, but patients with uh, refractory burning and pain that looks like seborrheic dermatitis which is not getting better you have to consider allergic contact dermatitis I think we really understand scalp sensitivities allergic contact dermatitis this whole spectrum quite poorly uh, in the present day um, but it has to be in our differential diagnosis scalp dysesthesias are a fascinating group of conditions these are patients that present with scalp symptoms like burning and pain and tenderness and when you look at the scalp, you think there's no way this patient could have these symptoms. The scalp looks relatively normal. These are scalp dysesthesias. Um, it can occur idiopathically. Some patients have underlying um, cervical spinal disease. Some patients have depression. Some patients have anxiety. Some patients um, have other issues like fibromyalgia. Uh, some patients have uh, autoimmune diseases of the neurological system like multiple sclerosis. Um, and so we have to keep a wide differential, but the scalp dysesthesias are challenging, but we have to keep them in mind. What about androgenetic alopecia? Well, I think it's also very poorly studied, but early male balding can itch. And often seborrheic dermatitis is so common that we ascribe the itching to the seborrheic dermatitis, but um, I think some patients with symptoms uh, truly have these symptoms from androgenetic alopecia. Again, more study is needed, but um, androgenetic alopecia is an inflammatory scalp disease. Uh, a lot of biopsies of androgenetic alopecia so, show inflammation, uh, inflammation in the infundibulum and isthmus. There's perifollicular fibrosis in a large percentage of, of patients with androgenetic alopecia, and so um, there's reason to have these scalp symptoms. Itching is important to ask about. And what you want to ask about when you're thinking itching is, is this a serious itching where I need to biopsy it? 
or is this itching that's consistent with something like seborrheic dermatitis? Well, this particular slide shows what happens to the intensity of itching over time as a patient shampoos their hair. And what a typical story of seborrheic dermatitis is, is that the itching increases day by day until the patient shampoos the hair. And once the patient shampoos the hair, the itching dies down again. And then it slowly builds up again, and once they dye their hair, uh, shampoo their hair, the itching dies, uh, dies down again. And so this is a very typical pattern of itching in seborrheic dermatitis. What about um, itching in scarring alopecias? Scarring alopecias can be associated with itch. Not all do, but things like lichen planopilaris, uh, disease entities like lichen planopilaris can itch. Um, some are asymptomatic, like frontal fibrosing alopecia. But patients notice that at times of stress, high stress, they itch a lot worse. And so those are very typical uh, things to understand and things to counsel patients about that when they're going through particularly stressful times, they may need to increase um, the uh, treatment that they're administering to the scalp. What about shedding? Again, shedding is challenging, and in your patient who presents with shedding, I'd encourage you to keep a very wide differential. When we hear our patients say, I'm shedding more than normal, we often think incorrectly that the patient is saying to us, I have a telogen effluvium. Hair shedding occurs in telogen effluvium. It occurs in genetic hair loss. It occurs in alopecia areata. It includes, occurs in lichen planopilaris. It occurs in the scarring alopecias. You can get shedding of broken hairs and hair breakage conditions. And so hair shedding really has a very, very large uh, differential. Perhaps one of the most important slides that I would like to present to you today is this one. And that is that the default diagnosis in your patients with excessive shedding needs to be androgenetic alopecia. Androgenetic alopecia presents with shedding. And it is a very common misdiagnosis to say that a patient presenting with shedding, a 21-year-old male who presents with shedding, or a 24-year-old female who presents with shedding, has telogen effluvium. Of course, they may have telogen effluvium. But if you have androgenetic alopecia at the top of your differential, you will diagnose um, this more times than not. And you will capture androgenetic alopecia at the earliest possible stages when probably some of these treatments are the most effective. Telogen effluvium, of course, causes shedding. And as you think about telogen effluvium and you're gathering history from your patient, you want to get a sense of how much are they shedding. And your patient may say, there's more hair in my brush, there's more hair in my drain. The days that I shower are the traumatic days. That's a mild telogen effluvium in most cases. Patients that say, there's hair in my food every day, there's hair in my refrigerator, those are typically more severe forms of telogen effluvium. And when you think about telogen effluvium, you want to think about the categories of things that cause shedding. And these include stress and scalp disease. They include um, things like seborrheic dermatitis, things like psoriasis, things like dermatomyositis. Disease of the scalp can cause shedding. There's no doubt about it that stress can cause shedding, especially when it's of high magnitude. Any endocrine problem can cause shedding, any endocrine problem. The most common prototypical one is, is thyroid disease, hyper and hypo. Nutritional issues can also cause shedding, low iron, crash diets, bariatric surgery, and medications. Any drug can theoretically cause shedding, um, certain ones like lithium, beta blockers, some antihypertensives, some uh, uh, antidepressants are, are more likely to cause shedding. Um, but many drugs can cause shedding, but are much more uh, rare. And so when I think of shedding, I ask my patients about these four categories, the so-called SENDs. These are conditions that send a hair from the growing phase to the shedding phase, and that's why I use this mnemonic SEND. And so when a patient says to me they're shedding, I usually write SEND down my page, and I ask them about stress and scalp disease, endocrine problems, nutritional issues, and drugs. Um, 
patient, of course, may not know what SEND stands for, but I want to make sure I've captured all the categories. What about eyebrow and eyelash loss? There are many conditions, about 100, that cause eyebrow and eyelash loss. And so I think when we are presented with a patient with eyebrow loss and eyelash loss, we have to have a certain respect. And when you go in to the consultation with that respect, um, it humbles you to realize that you're probably on track with the right diagnosis, but you may be missing some very unusual uh, forms of eyebrow and eyelash loss. Milfosis refers to isolated eyelash loss. Uh, metarosis refers to um, the term eyebrow and eyelash loss. The term metarosis has changed somewhat over time in terms of meaning eyelash loss to, to meaning the combination and so um, it still is used in different contexts but this is how I'd encourage you to use uh, these two terms. So when we have patients with eyebrow and eyelash loss, we have to think of a very broad differential. We have to think about skin diseases. We have to think about drugs and endocrine problems, metabolic diseases, uh, inflammatory conditions, infectious conditions. Um, not very often do we see a patient presenting with eyebrow loss who has leprosy, um, but not a day goes by that I see a patient with eyebrow loss that I don't think about leprosy. Uh, we have to think, think about toxins, we have to think about psychiatric diseases and systemic diseases. The causes of eyebrow and eyelash loss are quite um, humbling. Then there's hair loss that occurs from self-induced loss. The patient themselves is causing the eyebrow loss or the scalp loss. Trichoteromania refers to hair loss from repeated rubbing. And trichotemnomania occurs to the, uh, is referring to the obsessive shaving of hair. And so there are patients who present, generally with underlying psychologic and psychiatric disease, who have shaved the affected area, sometimes the scalp, sometimes eyebrows, sometimes eyelashes. And um, they themselves have caused the hair loss in this area, and you need to put on your uh, detective cap to, to go about thinking about this. What about frontal fibrosing alopecia? The most common things that we see are hair loss in the eyebrows from frontal fibrosing alopecia, alopecia areata, seborrheic dermatitis induced shedding, and some age related changes in the eyebrows. Frontal fibrosing alopecia causes eyebrow loss and it's often the first sign of hair loss in many patients with FFA. When you look up close, without dermoscopy, it looks very non-inflammatory. It looks very similar to alopecia areata, and it will fool you. And so, in a patient over 40, you must have frontal fibrosing alopecia at the top of your list as the cause of eyebrow loss. Of course, they may have alopecia areata, but if you don't have FFA at the top of your list, you'll miss it. When you look with trichoscopy, you may see some, some redness, you may see some changes, you may see eyebrows growing in different directions. But again, in eyebrow loss occurring in a 20 and 30 year old individual, alopecia areata supersedes uh, these autoimmune conditions as the most likely cause. But in eyebrow loss in a patient over 45, we really need to be thinking frontal fibrosing alopecia. In eyelash loss, we also have some helpful pearls, and that is that when a patient loses um, the upper and lower eyelash, it's appropriate to think about uh, alopecia areata. When the patient only has loss of the upper eyelashes and the lower eyelashes, which are harder to get, are unaffected, we certainly want to think about trichotillomania. Naturally, we need a broad differential, and both could be causing it, but these are some helpful pearls. We've got to ask about hair loss on the body. Patients may not notice, but we've got to ask. And of course, we'll look on physical examination if they do have hair loss on the beard and the eyebrows and the eyelash and body hairs. This is a patient with very typical alopecia areata uh, of the beard, so-called alopecia areata barbe. And um, this is not uncommon. The thing that I'd like to remind you about alopecia areata barbe is a significant proportion of these males 
go on to develop alopecia areata of the scalp, uh, probably as high as 50%. And so um, we um, may want to have uh, discussions with patients depending on what their scalp looks like. Uh, I think it's very important that a patient who presents with alopecia uh, barbe have a full physical examination to look for changes in the scalp. Are there broken hairs? Are there exclamation mark hairs? Uh, many patients say, my scalp's fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with my scalp. But you do see early features of alopecia areata in the scalp. We want to ask about medical uh, history. And so we want to ask about what medical conditions does the patient have can lead us towards a diagnosis in some cases. Do they have chronic low iron? Do they have any autoimmune issues? Do they have joint pains? Uh, do they have chronic diarrhea? Do they have IBS? Um, do they have um, headaches? We really want to think carefully about what systemic issues does the patient have? What medications do they need for these? We want to think about recent and remote surgeries. So what surgeries has the patient had? A patient who presents to clinic with um, a recent onset of cosmetic surgery affecting the frontal hairline, um, you know, may, that may be very relevant to a diagnosis of um, surgery-related hair loss in the frontal hairline, perhaps a scarring hair loss in the frontal hairline. And so surgical history is very important. If the patient has been put under general anesthesia, that can trigger hair loss in some patients, but of course not all and we want to think about medications. We're programmed to think about medications that were introduced about three months before the hair loss started. And that's relevant for most acute telogen effluviums. We want to ask about recent medications. But remember, some medications cause hair loss over a long period of time. Um, when you think about some of the uh, aromatase inhibitors for breast cancer, these particular medications uh, trigger an androgenetic type hair loss picture and that hair loss occurs over a longer period of time. And then we want to think about family history. We want to ask about a family history of androgenetic alopecia, of course. And, um, but we want to talk about a family history of autoimmune diseases. We want to think about a family history of uh, malignancies, which may uh, affect how you prescribe certain medications, including some of the immunosuppressants uh, and possibly even some hormonal um, blocking medications. But I think family history is important as well. And in some patients, especially women who present with androgenetic alopecia, a common question is, there's no one in my family who has androgenetic alopecia. Um, and certainly that's true for some patients. And we know that androgenetic alopecia in women doesn't always have as strong of a family history as in males. But sometimes when a patient presents with androgenetic alopecia, and I'm trying to help them understand the condition and, and possibly um, even cope and, and get a better understanding of, of, is this truly the right diagnosis? Uh, it's helpful sometimes to ask to see a picture, to see a picture of a mom or a dad or a grandparent. Because in a large percentage of these patients, I would say probably as high as 50%, the patient that I'm looking at in the picture parent or the grandparent, they have androgenetic alopecia. And so yes, they may have developed androgenetic alopecia in their 40s or 50s, but they have androgenetic alopecia. And I think it's helpful for the patient to understand that um, there may be some genetics contributing to it. And finally, as we're gathering historical information, as we're sitting in front of the patient and asking questions, we want to remember to ask our female patients uh, about the menstrual cycles and want to ask about acne and hirsutism. Of course, what we're thinking about here is there, is there any androgen, is there any source of increased androgen? Or is there any hormonal abnormalities which contributing to the patient's hair loss that we need to diagnose for the health of the patient? And so we're often thinking about congenital adrenal hyperplasia and more commonly polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is quite common in our population. Both of these look very similar. Patients often present with hirsutism, irregular periods, acne, decreased fertility. And so you really want to ask about acne, hirsutism, and the menstrual cycles in all women presenting with um, uh, hair loss. 
And often in patients with irregular periods, I will order a more extensive workup, which includes testosterone, DHEAS, LH and FSH on the third day or fourth day of the menstrual cycle, estradiol, 17-hydroxy progesterone to rule out congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and this must be done on the third or fourth day of the menstrual cycle. With irregular periods, we might also include a prolactin because uh, the gynecologist may uh, ask for that or may order it themselves, so we're, we're helping the patients work up for irregular periods. Um, an AM cortisol. And so there's certainly a wider differential for irregular periods, um, but these are the things that we might think about in a patient presenting with irregular period. In a patient that presents with regular periods but has hair loss with acne or hair loss with hirsutism, certainly the most cost-effective tests are testosterone and, and DHEAS, evaluating for a source of um, adrenal androgens and ovarian androgens, and we may order an androstenedione as well. And so in conclusion, I'd like to leave you with the main point that the history of the patient is extremely relevant to diagnosing hair loss. That by gathering information from these 10 questions carefully, we can often know what the patient has even before um, going to examine their scalp, before using trichoscopy, before even considering a biopsy. And so again, the words of William Osler, listen to your patient, he is telling you the diagnosis. I think this is particularly relevant to hair loss medicine, and I think that the information our patients share with us, if we take it in and absorb it properly, really points us to the diagnosis more times than we realize. With that, I'd like to thank you again for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.